Hey guys and welcome to Aussie Reviews and welcome to this month's Q&A series. This is exclusively available to those of you who support me on Patreon and that can be as little as a dollar a month. Now guys, I did a post recently there on Facebook where I explained the situation with just how many questions I get every single day from different people. Now look, this can be upward to 50 uh, emails or private messages a day. The reality of that, guys, is it takes a long time to you know, respond individually to each one of them. So this is why I've been left with no other choice but to limit it to those of you who ask questions here on Patreon, because I do need some sort of financial assistance to dedicate that amount of time in responding to everyone's emails. So I look at it this way, like you know, if you were a plumber, for example, and would you be giving how-to instruction and help to people who were phoning you or sending you emails every day um, when you're not getting work of your own done and able to actually earn income. So this is a situation that I'm faced with. So in a nutshell, guys, all I'm simply asking for is someone who would like to show some support for me, not even just to ask questions, but just to show some support. Please help me out from just as little as a dollar a month. So $12 a year, less than a magazine subscription, and obviously you can get personalized help if you require it. So anyhow, let's get into this month's questions. Okay, so the first question I got here is from Ross Fisher and he says, uh, the OSA 23 Game King ammo is fantastic in all of my rifles, so what doesn't it shoot well with and why is it so hard to get in New South Wales? Well, I think, Ross, you just answered your own question there, mate. Um, it shoots well in virtually every rifle I've tried it in and that's why it's hard to get because it's priced extremely well compared to the American-made ammunition and um, you know that's why it sells out fairly quickly so what you need to do is just put it on back order with your local gun shop wait a month or whatever it is until they've run their next batch of it and uh, get it from there now the next question i've got here is from alex mcdonald and he says hi ozzy not a gun question as such uh, i watch with interest the gun issues on uh, gun control in the usa and do you think that we would be constantly pushed into a corner in Australia by the anti-gun lobby as they are in the States? Well, no, Alex, I don't think they're pushed into a corner over there. They're the ones who are pushing uh, you know, politicians and the anti-gun crowd into a corner over there because um, they're very organised. And obviously, you know, the biggest thing that they've got um, you know, behind them is a constitutional right to bear arms. Um, now, not everyone gets that right. There are um, exceptions to it, like convicted criminals and uh, people in domestic violence situations, uh, people who have been dishonorably discharged from the military and so forth. There's a lot of um, exceptions to that, um, which a lot of people don't know. But anyhow, getting back to it, uh, you know, they have that constitutional right that they can push because it's right. Where well, here in Australia, it's not written into a Bill of Rights or it's not a constitutional right. Do I believe that it's a right? Yes, I do. I believe you have a right to apply for a gun license, just like you have a right to apply for a car license. But this is where the uh, anti-gun crowd here in Australia uh, rely on the fact that, in their view, it's a privilege. So you're privileged, so therefore we can take that privilege off you. The thing that I've got the problem with here in Australia is um, the anti-gun crowd here, I mean, they're not experts. I mean. I would pretty much guarantee if I handed any of them a firearm and told them to tell me the ins and outs of it, they'd just look at me. They wouldn't even know because what sort of people come up with catchphrases like semi-semi-automatic, um, you know, rapid-fire shotgun. As much as shooters laugh and think that's all just a joke, guys, they're going to push ahead with it. They are going to definitely push ahead with it and it's going to be another Adler debacle. And as much as we whinge and all the rest of it, unless we actually do something and start getting involved now, get behind people like the Shooters Union so they can get out into the media and have the money to be able to fight and release media statements um, to uh, fight back against all these lies, um, it's going to be another ban. You know, there'll be another recategorization in my view, and this will just continue on and on. So that's my thoughts on it there, Alex. Um, you really need to get involved here in Australia, and I mean you. Um, and your friends, uh, all of us, everyone has to get involved because um, if we don't and we just sit there and whinge amongst uh, ourselves, it'll just continue to happen. We'll lose more and more as each year goes by. And that's what's happened ever since 1996. Those of you who uh, go, oh, that's rubbish, they haven't done a thing. Well, really, we've got magazine restrictions now. We've got uh, caliber restrictions. Now we've seen, uh, obviously, the lever action recategorization. We've also got appearance uh, restrictions. 
you know, so it just goes on and on. So unless you draw a line in the sand and go, no, I've had a gut full of this, I'm going to get involved, I'm going to do something, um, it will continue on. So it's really up to us. Now I've got three questions here from Cam. He says, uh, is it true heavier grain bullets will uh, recoil more? Uh, well, yes, it will, mate. Um, like if you've got a 308, for example, um, and you're using like 135 grain or 130 grain ammunition, um, that's you know reasonably mild to use, um, as opposed to going up the scale to like 180 grain ammunition. So you'll definitely feel the difference there. Now, your next question is, uh, what shooting rest do I recommend? Uh, mate, look, I just use Cardwell ones. Um, you know. I don't really use anything fancy there. They're, they're pretty cheap entry level type ones, but they do the job for what I want. Um, you'll see a complete different story when you go to the ranges and you see people who are in, you know, like um, professional bench rest competitions. I mean, those guys have got some really high end gear. Um, but obviously, that's my, you know, not my need. It may be yours, but um, yeah, just have a look around. But I just use the card well hunt. They, they do the job for me, put it that way. And your final question here is, does a cheek uh, rest absorb recoil, enhance shot quality and control? Well, no, not really. The idea behind a, a cheek rest is so that you can uh, have the correct side alignment when using a scope. So, um, you know, take the Ruger American Rimfire rifle, for example. Now, it's got the interchangeable um, parts there on the rear of the stock, so you can get an interchangeable uh, strap, basically, that has a uh, cheek rest built into it. Um, and then you have the one that doesn't. So obviously the one that doesn't, you use that with the open sights that come with the rifle, and then the one with the uh, cheek riser or cheek rest in it, you use that for using a scope. So that's the difference um, there. It's not so much you know, for uh, uh, higher control or absorbing recoil as such, it's just to get that correct scope or sight alignment, which obviously in turn will make your shooting more accurate. Now, next question I've got here is from Anthony Hawes, and he says, Hey, Aussie, just a quick question on magazines on CZ and Lithgo. Uh, will CZ or Lithgo release a 25 rounder for general use here in Australia for Category A? Um, I have inquired about importing a few mags, but was told by a gun shop in Brisbane that importing a 25 round magazine in a Cat A is prohibited. Uh, can you confirm this for me, please? Mate, a couple of things. Um, I doubt they'll do it. Um, I don't know why really because at the end of the day they're going to make a lot of sales, put it that way, because people aren't going to have to pay the overinflated prices for the 25 round magazines that you see there um, you know, online. Now um, when I say online I'm talking about online here in Australia and all of us know if you see like BX25s or any high cap mags, they're very expensive and what's the reason for it? Because you know overseas they're like a $20 magazine yet here they're like $300. Well, guys, it's simply uh, red tape. That's what it is. Um, you know, it's only a feral pest controller um, that can import these high cap mags. And then there's months of red tape paperwork and waiting for that to happen. So, of course, if the feral pest controller imports, you know, like say, for example, five magazines, um, you know, do you really think that they're going to then sell those magazines for like $20 or $30? You know, no, they're not. Um, if they sell any of the magazines, they're going to demand a high price for it because they know that nobody else can import them. So this has always been my argument about um, you know, gun laws. Gun laws don't prohibit anything. Stuff is still available, but it just sends the price through the roof. So um, you know, that's why I disagree with a lot of it. So getting back to it, mate, um, in particular where this comes from is a customs prohibited import regulation. And under that, you've got to look at what magazines are interchangeable once they start going over like 10 rounds. So for this in particular, have a look at what uh, rifle uses the same magazine. Okay, obviously the uh, CZ512, which is the semi-auto 22. So if you put a magazine over 10 rounds in that rifle, what does it make it? It makes it category D. So they don't care that it's going in a category A. All they do is they look at that magazine and go, what can it be interchanged with? Um, and then they'll go, well, Cat C, you know, um, 10 shot um, CZ512, but if you put that in, it puts it up to Cat D, so we'll also put the requirements for that magazine up as well for you to be able to import it. So that's why you won't be able to import it unless you're a feral pest controller. Same with the uh, Ruger 1022. You know, once you put over 10 rounds and that becomes Cat D, so therefore the requirements are exactly that. 
Now we have seen like from um, Lucky 13, you know, they're making magazines, obviously the 25 rounders and 15 rounders for the 1022. Um, mate, honestly, I'd, look, I'd even start like a, a petition um, or something. You could do it online and just see who's interested in, um, you know, having a magazine over 10 rounds for their um, Lithgo or their CZ if they were to make them here and then, you know, present that to Lucky 13. You know, this is just an idea. And then perhaps if they see enough, um, you know, potential sales in it, it'll be worth their while and perhaps they'll make that magazine. So, um, yeah, I hope I've explained that well, mate. It's just um, annoying because the uh, federal import laws are completely separate to what our state law allows. You know, even though we can have that magazine here legally, it's getting it in under those federal import laws and that's the way they do it. So, look, very restrictive and my personal view, mate, it's just a complete um, waste of time. I mean, I've had uh, other feral pest controllers that I know have imported those magazines to use in the Category A firearm and they've had to provide their contracts proof of earnings and everything like that to the Attorney General's department to get those um, firearm magazines in just to use with their, you know, Ruger American Rimfire, for example. So it's, it's just a lot of red tape and um, it's just another thing that needs to go in my own personal view. But I hope I've explained it enough for you to see where they're coming from with it. Now, the next question I got here is from Sean Fraser and he says, um, um, what's your safety plan and safety precautions you use for different ammunition types when out hunting? Uh, there's a bit more to his question, just a bit of background basically where, you know, reloading and precautions there, but it comes down to this main part. So look, Sean, it's pretty straightforward for me, mate, because most of the time, even when I've been out contract shooting, you know, I'm either using um, a 22 uh, or I'm using a shotgun, or I'm using a 2D3 or a 308. So it's pretty hard to mix those up because obviously the substantial difference in their appearance and sizes. But I still carry ammunition separately um, in separate containers. So I won't mix up ammunition. So therefore, like the chance of me, you know, mixing it up would be very minimal in the field because obviously I go to the box that has the correct uh, ammunition in it. And you know, if you're shooting, for example, like if you've gone out where you are, you've parked, um, you know, you've got your firearms out and you're just going, right, okay, I'm gonna go for a walk now, whatever. Well, you know, you're gonna load up the magazine, you know, prior to walking away from your campsite. So, you know, load the magazine up, you just double check it and make sure that you've got the correct ammunition. So that's all I do. Next question here is from Jake Latham. And he says, hey, Aussie, um, do you or have you ever made your own steel targets at home? Uh, mate, no, I don't. I buy all mine from STS Targets, Australian made, Australian uh, made steel. So obviously all the targets are Australian made. So uh, Sean Milner, who runs STS Targets, great bloke to deal with. His prices certainly aren't overinflated, and I would prefer to actually pay him for what he asks for his targets than try to uh, one learn how to <laughs> to weld and things like that myself, um, and obviously put aside the time required to make my own targets. So. I just prefer to buy them from STS targets. Next question I got here is from Edward Gateman. He says, hey Aussie, uh, do you have any experience with Nikon scopes? Um, I'm looking at their three to nine by 40, two to three BDC 600. Uh, mate, yes, I do have a little bit of experience with them. Um, the four to 16 by 42 I used in the Howard Mini Action two to three review, but the actual Varmint model. Okay, I've got two up, the Ultralight and the Varmint. Have a look at the varmint model because I used it with that. So once it was sighted in there, um, you know, at 100, I could just go straight up to 200 and, you know, it, it worked perfectly. It was right on. So, um, you know, not the exact model that you want there, mate, but um, look, nice clear optic and everything. I think from memory they're made in the Philippines. So, look, it's not an optic that uh, I'd count my life on, put it that way. Um, personally, I have my own personal likes with optics, but I will be very honest, I had nothing wrong um, or nothing go wrong with that optic. It was right on, I could shoot very accurately with it and it was pretty clear. So yeah, take a look at one. I can't really see any negatives with it other than where it's made. The next question I got here is from Sean and he says, um, has there been any products that you've reviewed that have been so bad that you didn't post the review? Uh, mate, the breakthrough cleaning products, um, that was the only one and uh, I didn't even bother starting the review with it. So what happened was um, 
you know, it was sent to me and um, the company that sent it to me said, yeah, this stuff is fantastic. It's military grade, it'll get off all the carbon and all the rest of it. So all I did was I simply, after I'd come back from doing some contract shooting, I pulled out the uh, piston out of my um, SR556 rifle and put it on that didn't come off, did it? It did not get that hard carbon removed from there. So then what I did is I then just put on some of that um, uh, uh, foam ball cleaner from uh, Gunslick, and I think Hoppies have got um, an equivalent out now as well. I put that on there, let it sit there for like, you know, 20 minutes, and then I just wiped it all clean. It just came straight off. So what I did was I uh, let, obviously, the uh, company know that sent it to me, and I just said, look, it just doesn't work. Um, you know, products that I've used for many years just work straight away. So he said to me, look, no dramas whatsoever. Um, I'll definitely get back to you on it um, and see what the company um, has got to say. Yada, 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 nothing. Never heard a thing ever again. So I wasn't going to then waste my time filming it um, because it, of really it's just a minor product. It's not like a firearm with a major flaw that's not working. It's just simply a cleaning product. And I thought, what's the point in wasting my time? Uh, now the second part of your question, Sean, uh, when are we going to see an Aussie Reviews blooper reel? But uh, to be honest, like a lot of the stuff, like you know, um, like once I've edited it all, like all the footage and everything just gets deleted. Um, so it'd be pretty hard to do. But most of the bloopers, mate, usually are me yelling at the dog to get out of the way. You know, um, like I've, I, it just yeah, <laughs> that's probably the main thing. Is like Cooper will come up, like you know, when I'm like. Yeah, like checking the uh, the sighting in groups there with a rifle of the target, you know. I've had him come up before and then just drop a big turd in the background <laughs> right near the target, you know, like just, yeah, no decorum that dog, that's for sure. But uh, just, yeah, things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I haven't had a lot of bloopers as such, not to the degree where I thought oh, I'd put a blooper reel together. So yeah, I don't think one will come, but uh, who knows, maybe in the future um, I might do one. The next question I've got here is from Daniel Rowe, and he says, Hey Ozzy, um, are we going to see you at the Sydney SSAA SHOT Show this year? Uh, no, mate, you won't, because um, basically um, what it comes down to is uh, just money. You know, like um, a lot of the time, like well, now what I'm doing is I'm uh, having a stand when I go to the show, so there's a couple of thousand dollars just to have a small uh, cubicle at the show, and then you've got to pay liability insurance, and then obviously for me, because travelling... From Queensland down to Sydney there's going to be money you know to get down there as well and <clears throat> at the end of the day mate it's just not profitable whatsoever um, not saying that I don't want to go I'd love to be able to go but when I'm looking at losing a couple of thousand dollars just to go and attend a show mate I've got other priorities and I just can't do it so um, in uh, you know uh, the other side the flip side of that is I'll go into the SHOT Show at Brisbane and I'll do that every two years. So that's when it's on and that's where I'll be. Maybe in the future I might expand out, but mate, at this stage, I just simply can't financially. Okay, so the next question I've got here is from Andrew Smith and he says, Hey Ozzy, I'm new to the sport of shooting. I've got a few questions about licensing. Can I apply for a CAT AB license at the same time as applying for a collector's license? So look, technically, yes, you can, but um, whether they'll approve it or not is another thing. The reason I say that is with a collector's license, you need to have basically a covering letter justifying or showing evidence that you have a prolonged interest in uh, firearms and collecting of firearms. So, um, you know, how do you do that? Well, obviously, if you've been a member of a club for quite a few years, that can be just the SSAA or Shooters Union or something like that. Um, you can say, well, look, I've been a member of a club for a couple of years. I want to get into collecting. Um, and you can go down that avenue. Or you can also go down the avenue of saying, well, look, I read a lot of uh, collectible uh, books on firearms. I, I like to uh, uh, read different articles about different uh, conflicts at different war eras and things like that as it relates to firearms. And you may get an approval there. But my feeling on it is they will probably knock you back and say, well, look, you, you don't even have a license. You haven't even been a member of a club. We want to see, um, you know, some longer um, interest or, or evidence of interest in uh, firearms. So that's probably my thoughts on it. Now, the next part of your question here is uh, you say, um, I've also watched your beginner series and decide to go with the Ruger American uh, 22LR. Should I submit my PTA with my license application? 
Yes, definitely do that. Um, the reason is it will save you um, some of that mandatory waiting period. So if you apply for your license and then um, you get your license after like about two months, I think they're running out at the moment here in Queensland, and then you've got to wait another 28 days to get your PTA. So put in for your license and your PTA, so all of it should be approved around the same time. So then that way you can go straight out to the uh, gun shop and pick up um, you know, a 22 of your choice there. Um, now you've said here your last party question is about um, any firearm store suggestions in Brisbane. Mate, look, there's a few of them. Um, obviously you've got Cleavers there at Redcliffe, Old Margate. So look, I don't know where you're located in Brisbane, so I'll just rattle off a few of them. Um, then you've got On Target over at uh, Capera, so you know, over the western side there of uh, Brizzy. Um, Queensland Gun Exchange, they're over at East Brisbane there. Um, and then just down the road from Queensland Gun Exchange, you've got Rebel. And then down further, like Logan area, you've got uh, Gun World. So um, look, there's, there's a few around. And then you've got some more on the fringes of Brisbane, but not knowing where you are, mate, um, I don't know where to sort of advise you to go uh, in particular to your location, but have a look at those. They're all worth going into because each gun shop really likes to cater for uh, different needs. Like for example, you know, you'll have cleavers. I mean, they're just the, uh, you know, the, the cat C and D kings, you know, they've got a heap of cat C and D stuff up on the walls, which is just interesting to have a look at. But then, um, you know, like you'll go over like on target and like, yeah, they're right into their shotgun stuff. So, you know, um, it's interesting just to see what they've got and, and get some advice there. You know, then you go to places like uh, Rebels, you know, and they've got a, um, like, like honestly, like a display on their second level there, which is a lot of, um, you know, older war stuff and collectible things. So, you know, it's really interesting. So, like, like I say, try them all, mate. Um, go around and uh, make yourself known to all of them and um, just see which one you like. Okay, guys, so that concludes this month's Q&A series. So, um, look, once again, thank you very much for the questions. I really do enjoy getting the uh, different questions and helping you guys out who obviously help me out on Patreon. So thanks very much for all your assistance and uh, we'll see you on the next month's edition of Q&A.